tonight, I'm going to show you some video footage that's going to be shocking, but I want to know from you in the comments, have you had any type of alien encounter or UFO encounter in your lifetime? There are four different kinds of alien encounters. I'm sure you've heard of them before, especially if you've heard of the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Okay, so this side of the church watches movies. This side is Amish. Close, close Encounters of the Third Kind. And there are, so what are the different kinds? I want to give you this very, very quickly because I think this is important. The close encounter of the first kind, this type involves sightings of a UFO at a distance of 500 feet or less. This close proximity allows for detailed observations of the UFO, such as its shape, lights, and colors. That's the first kind. Close encounters of the second kind. We're going to get into what it, the Bible has to say here in a moment. These encounters involve not only sighting, but also physical effects. It could be interference with electronic devices, animals reacting, car engines stopping, uh, physical marks on the ground or vegetation, or the observer experiencing psychological effects like heat or discomfort. Then, after the movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, this type signifies an encounter where the occupants or pilots of a UFO are observed. These occupants could be humanoid or not and might communicate or interact with the observer in some way. And then you have close encounters of the... Okay, you guys are going to... This is, this is like the most fun sermon material in human history. You guys are going to have to wake up a little bit with me here tonight. Nudge your neighbor say, wake up. Close encounters of the... Fourth kind, this is more controversial category that involves the person being abducted by the UFO or its occupants. This might include being taken onto a spacecraft, involves lost time or memory gaps. You say, all of this sounds crazy. I agree with you. And until I wrote this book, I would have never imagined. The moment I wrote this book, the preachers that if I named their name, every single one of you would know who they were that have come to me privately and said, I fit into one of those categories. And I said, well, can I interview about it? And they said, no. And can you blame them? Because it has been so stigmatized. And we have to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. When I was working in an international prayer center, my first area of ministry was prayer. And I prayed for more than 100,000 people one-on-one -on -one in this prayer ministry. And I, as I started to work there, I began to get these calls trickling in of people who had experience and encounters with entities that they needed deliverance and they needed prayer. And the stories they told me were so out of the norm, I just dismiss, dismissed them as being, you know, chemically imbalanced, mentally deranged in some way, shape, or form, but then they begin to trickle in one after another across states, across cultures, across denominations. People begin to have the same experience and describe the same thing to me that someone else had described, and I thought, maybe there's something to this. And there is something to it. Dr. Lester Sumrall, one of the great generals of faith, wrote a book called Alien Entities to show the importance of addressing this issue, a book, by the way, that I highly recommend. So if you're watching online, I want you to put the number. We talked about the first kind, the second kind, the third kind, and the fourth kind. I want you to just put the number in the comments of which one you, thought, you think you've experienced. And over the last few months, there's been a lot of headlines in the news. How many of you have seen them about UFOs, UAPs? I'm going to make a prediction right now that over the next month, you're going to see an explosion of that over the next month, that there is going to be a lot more sightings, a lot more strange things. I believe 2024, 25, and 26 will be the years where we experience the prophecy that says there will be signs in the heavens. I think we've tried to figure that out for a long, long time, and we've tried to think, well, maybe this is it, maybe that is it. This year, we're going to discover what it truly means for there to be signs in the heavens. Do we have some of those news headlines that I had? I just wanted to look at a couple of them. Every Everyone is suddenly talking about aliens. U.S. urged to reveal UFO e evidence after claim that it has intact alien vehicles. Ex-intelligence officials say government is hiding alien technology from Congress. U.S. has UFOs of non-human origin. Everybody say non-human. So there's been a very interesting change in language over the last what, three or four years from extraterrestrial to non-human. We will get into that in a moment. 
And so this has been ex-Pentagon officials, DOD, congressional testimony that we'll talk about here in a moment has all come out. What happened at the mall in Miami? Were there Nephilim walking around the mall in Miami? What about over in Peru where children were being abducted and they saw beings like flying in the sky and, and in the trees and abducting children? Do you know what the government came out and said concerning that? They said it was miners with jetpacks. Oh, no, it wasn't aliens. It was just miners, gold miners, like illegal rogue gold miners with jetpacks. Okay, we believe you. Another report came out this past week where the United States government says, no, 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 no. We, we assure you we have done an investigation into ourselves. And we can assure you that we have no such craft whatsoever. The United States government has been investigating UFOs. Here's some statistics for you. Since at least the 1940s, the Air Force's Project Blue Book was one of the most famous investigations. They say it started in 52 to all the way 69, but I think it stretched beyond those. Here's some of those stats. The vast majority of UFO sightings can be explained by natural phenomenon such as aircraft, balloons, water phenomenon. However, and we're going to debunk some UFO stuff here tonight. We're going to debunk it and show you the video evidence that it wasn't a UFO at all because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. But we're going to also show you some things that are very hard to explain. 51% regard UFO sightings in the United States reported by the military as evidence of extraterrestrial life. More than 7,000 reports came into one agency in 2020 alone in the United States. The director of National Intel says there were 510 sightings with 171 of them demonstrating unusual flight characteristics that they could not explain. More people in America believe in aliens than believe in God. So this is why we have to talk about this. This is why we've got to begin to address this issue, because I think this is going to be used to deceive millions and millions of people. UFOs have been clocked at speeds. Do we have the video of, uh, uh, I believe his name's Fravor. Do we have the video of Fravor's UFO experience? It's the little Tic Tac video. This is one of the actually the most credible uh, UFO videos out there. This is what he was documenting. You can keep the lights up. You can keep the lights up for this one. As, as you're showing that, let me show you, and, and he's, he's such a credible witness. In his testimony, he says, and this is in my book, I have his full testimony in Summoning the Demon. You can go to summoningthedemon.com to get it. And here's what he said at the conclusion. I would like to say that the TikTok object that we engaged in November 2004 was far superior to anything that we had at that time, the U.S. military, have today or are looking to develop in the next 10 plus years. If we in fact have programs that possess this technology, it needs to have oversight from those people that the citizens of this great country elected to office to represent what is best for the United States and in the best interest of its citizens. That's coming from a very, very reputable source. Why is this important? Because everyone's talking about it, and we need to be able to give a biblical answer. Here's one of the very interesting questions. Is this a psychological operation? I think the same thing when I see David Grush and his testimony. Do we have his, do we have his video? Let's look at what David Grush says. When you say crash retrieval, what do you mean? Uh, these are retrieving non-human origin uh, technical vehicles, you know, call it spacecraft if you will. Uh, it's probably not the right parlance, but uh, no kidding, non-human, exotic origin vehicles that have either landed or crashed. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. Quite a number. Is he telling the truth? Is it a psychological operation? The answer to that question is yes. Everybody say yes. Does the Bible say anything about aliens? Are there UFOs in the Bible? What should be our response? Why does it matter to the average Christian? 
Well, as we said, more than half of Americans believe in aliens. More Americans believe in aliens than believe in God. But what about alien religions? We've discussed this in the past, but for those who are just joining us on this conversation, if you want to witness to people, you've got to be able to give an answer because here's some of the alien religions that we have right now in the United States of America. We have Mormonism, which we have discussed. Do you have that slide? Mormonism, Islam, Raelism, Scientology. How many of you ever heard of Tom Cruise? How about John Travolta? Greece is the word. It's the last good movie he did. No, I don't know. They believe legitimately that their God is an alien. So how do you give an answer to that? Are you just going to, ah, oh, no, there ain't nothing to that. Then, you, then you're going to lose a generation because there are people out there with far more interesting and fascinating stories. And I'm here to tell you, when I, when I went to the Word of God to try to bring some sanity to this subject, the purpose of this book is to bring people back to the Word of God. And I want to just, let's get out of the extremes and let's get to the Word. In here, it was even more extreme. How many of you know there's some extreme stuff in this book? It's pretty interesting. I think we have done a terrible job at presenting the fascinating nature of the truths in this book, and it's time to dig into all of it. How about evolution? Do you know the God of the United States of America is Darwin? Darwinian evolution. It is worshiped. It has been replaced. Creation has been replaced in our schools with evolution, and so our children think they are animals, and so they might as well behave as such. Your grandfather was not a chimpanzee or a banana, because according to evolution, your, grandfather, your grandparents are both chimpanzee and a banana. Which came first? Who knows? The chimpanzee or the banana. One of the most intellectual minds on the planet, Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, the mouthpiece and poster child of atheism, says that he believes that it is possible that aliens seeded life onto this planet. So, throughout the last century and beyond, UFOs have been used to deceive millions of people, and the church has done nothing to give an answer to this. It has been completely and totally ignored. And they pettifog the issue by throwing in all these hoaxes like aliens in the mall in Miami. And all it took is some special effects experts to take a look at the video. Here is what actually happened in the mall in Miami. Is it a creature walking? I don't know what it is, honestly. This is the clip that went viral. This is what everyone was like, oh my God, aliens are real. But of course, everything has been debunked. The airspace was not at all shut down. The police scanners were not turned off. The gunshots were actually just fireworks, most likely. This guy who gave a, an accounting of it admitted to being like, guys, I made it up. I was trolling. You guys are stupid. But that still doesn't explain what is that creature moving across the scene. Well, I did some analysis. I found a slightly higher quality video with less compression, and then I stabilized it around the creature, and I ran it through some upscaling. And so it is three people walking side by side. That's it? That's it! <laughs> it's just three people just walking. But, no, you're uh, right. It's three people it's walking. It's just three dudes. Walk. Case closed. Man, we sure like to invent things from blurry pixels, don't we? It was a situation that ballooned out of control. The reason why all the police were sent is because they thought it was a terrorist attack. Everybody say, that's it? That's far less interesting. We want something juicier. And so we'll lean toward the more radical theory, and, and then we have to take, the, then people say, see, there are no aliens. No, 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 no. There are non-human entities at work in this earth, and you need to know who they are and how they operate. But there are a lot of, there are a lot of hoaxes, and there are a lot of mistaken identity. The military has technology that is beyond your comprehension. They possess technology. I believe we discussed some of that last week and in previous weeks, the crazy developments in military weaponry. Here's just one thing that they have called dragon fire. You know, we've had all these things about, you know, an alien laser coming down out of heaven. Let's, let's take a look at 
Dragonfire. Some newly released it. footage shows the Dragonfire laser directed energy weapon system in action, and it could be in the hands of military personnel in five years' time. It destroys targets with an intense beam of light and has pinpoint accuracy. It's able to hit something the size of a one pound coin from a kilometre away. So we, we've been talking about the cost of firing the uh, a laser weapon to be uh, ten pounds a shot. And, and really all we're talking about is, is the cost of the energy that you need to fire the laser weapon, um, obviously once you've got the, got the system in place in the first place. And that compares very favourably with, with missiles, which might be thousands or tens of thousands or even more um, per single shot. Scientists say Dragonfire proved itself in testing in Scotland and has the potential to transform the UK's defence capability. It could be used on land or okay, sea and would remove the reliance on high... It's amazing, isn't it? Missiles that cost tens upon tens of thousands of dollars versus, how much did they say for one shot of the laser? Ten pounds, which whatever that is in English. Thirteen dollars? Yeah, it'll transform the landscape and warfare as we know it. But there are unexplainable things that have been happening. Here's something that happened in Jerusalem that there is a website actually called the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, AARO. The government's really great at acronyms. AARO, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, where they try to debunk as much of these things as possible. This is one, if I'm not mistaken, they do not have an explanation for. Here's what happened in the Middle There's East. a new video this morning that some say may be proof we're not alone in the universe. A UFO in the form of a bright light is seen descending over the dome of the rock in Jerusalem. The video is said to be taken over the weekend. Uh, then suddenly the light shoots up into the sky. There you see it. Another video from a different angle uh, appears to show the light doing the same thing. Those clips have gone viral now. Now let's look at another object in the Middle East that they discovered. Um, that they have not yet been able to explain. Take a look at this. See it? They're trying to lock on to it because it's... And it, and it does change direction, so it's not simply a balloon floating through the air, which I don't know how many of you saw the footage of the jellyfish. Anybody? Who saw the footage of the jellyfish UFO? Just going to raise your hand just so I know. Okay. That seemed to be some just some balloons floating through the air, but look at that image right there. They have not yet been able to determine what that is. So there is technology out there we're still trying to figure out. But is it in the Bible? Here's what 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11 says, and I think this is a fascinating passage of Scripture. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. As they were walking along, this is Elijah and Elisha, and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. So there's a chariot of fire. I think we have an image of what that could potentially have looked like. Who knows what a chariot of fire is, but have you ever asked the question, why do angels need a chariot. That's fascinating, isn't it? Well, can't they just carry him? Why do angels need a mechanism that they travel in? So the point that we're trying to make here is that the spirit world is far more complicated than we have made it. That there is an actual reality to it and a tangibility to it and a practicality to it. So much so that it appears as though Seeds that were in heaven were planted in this earth that birthed the Garden of Eden. So much so, Moses was taken up into heaven and shown a pattern by which he formed the temple. So there was something very practical that he could in his mind then engineer here on this planet. Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4. Jesus said that there is going to be deception that comes upon the whole wide world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says that there will be lying signs and wonders. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 is fascinating to me. Uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Circle those words in your Bible. Everybody say seducing spirits. 
This actually translates wandering imposters. Another word for wandering is flying. Because angels don't merely meander, they fly. And another word for imposters is aliens. Seducing spirits, flying aliens. Could it be that in the latter times, some will depart, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, flying aliens, and doctrines of devils? It sounds ridiculous, but it's happening all the time because the belief in extraterrestrials requires no accountability. I'm not accountable to anybody. If extraterrestrials are real, God is not. So I don't have to worry about my eternal destiny. Here's what it says in 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Many deceivers have entered into the world. Well, if they entered into the world, let me ask you this question. Where did they come from? Many deceivers have entered into this world. So what are we dealing with? Is it alien or is it something else? You saw a clip of this professor, this gentleman, Kreskin, talking about alien abductions and what they resemble. Let's see a fuller context of what he had to say. Cases which I do not deal with generally because <coughs> they, they seem to be, <coughs> they seem to have an element of, of, the, of the parapsychological in them. There's just no question that some of the reports seem to tell of the sort of thing that you find in poltergeist phenomena. Really? Things that sort. In the Department of Defense, there was a gentleman who was over the UAP task force. His name was Luis Elizondo. He was also attempting to investigate these phenomenon, and when he was speaking with someone with a higher classification, he was warned, and here's what was said to Luis Elizondo I about remember UFOs. I the conversation very well. Um, this is a person I respected tremendously, very, very senior person. He told me, he said, Lou, I want you to stop, stop doing this. I said, okay, sir, I, I, I certainly can, but may I ask why? And he says, well, we already know what it is. Now, at that moment, I, I honestly thought maybe it was our own technology. I was running up against some super uber secret sap, and, uh, you know, they were telling me to stop. And I said, okay, sir, so, so it's ours? And he said, no, that's not what I'm saying. And he said, uh, he asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I wasn't quite sure where he was going with that. And I said, well, sir, I, 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 I think I know what it says. What, where are you going with this? And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic and we should not be pursuing them. Yeah. And uh, I, I, he, was, he wasn't kidding. He was, that's exactly how, how he felt. So this is a Pentagon. Uh, this is a DO, Department of Defense official uh, saying, stop looking at UFOs because they're demonic. Correct. What about the stash on that guy, by the way? Senior in the Department of Defense, senior official says, stop looking into UFOs because they're demonic. I tell you, you need to look into them because they're demonic. Go to with me to Luke, chapter number 10. Luke, chapter 10. Praise God. How many of you love the Bible? Luke, chapter number 10. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is commissioning the 70. And he's sending them out into the city and into the regions to minister on his behalf and to prepare the way for him because he's going to be visiting those cities himself later. Give me some light down here because I may be down here for a minute. In fact, let's look very quickly at verse number 1, just so you have the context of what's being said here. Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city, into every place, whether he himself would come. Therefore, said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his field. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way, and into whatsoever house you enter, first say, peace be unto this house. He's teaching them how to release virtue. 
He's teaching them how to release protection and blessing onto a house. And then he says, if they reject you, here's how you release a curse over the house. That's a conversation for another day. Then we get to verse number 17. Are y'all getting this online? We need to become word people. Make sure everything comes back to the word. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. Now notice, devils are not what he mentioned in this particular commission. It was just a byproduct of the authority that they were walking in. I want you to notice also that there is joy in serving the Lord. There is a supernatural joy and victory that accompanies your obedience in the Great Commission. They experience the joy of supernatural provision. How many of you would like to experience that joy? Because he said, don't take any money with you. I'm going to supply for you. They experienced a supernatural joy of his provision because clothes were provided for them. Food was provided for them. In fact, at the end of his ministry, he looks at them and says, did you lack anything while you were with, uh, with me? And they said, nothing. We lacked absolutely nothing. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not going to lack a thing. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. And he said unto them, fascinating, fascinating way to respond, I beheld Satan as light, lightning fall from heaven. Well, that's an interesting response to that, isn't it? Even the devils are subject to us. I saw Satan fall like lightning. Okay. When? Some say, at the cross. Hadn't happened yet. When? When did Satan fall like lightning? When he attempted to rebel. Some say that happened in Genesis chapter 1, between verses 1 and 2. God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, became, without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Since God does not create anything without form, that is void, that is chaotic, that is dark, it's believed by many. You can take it to the Lord. You can study it for yourself and see whether it's true. It's just speculation that that's where Satan fell, that his fall caused that darkness to come upon the earth. And what we see happening in the remainder of the verses in Genesis chapter 1 is a recreation of what God wanted to do in the earth. And now he's using man and making him the pinnacle of his creation. Now, there is a theory. Can I teach? Can I teach? Is that Okay. There is a theory that is called the gap theory. It takes what I just explained to you, that there is an apparent disconnect between verses 1 and 2, and then it just takes it into a whole, as far as I'm concerned, fiction that's just kind of made up about what could have been and what might have been. And here's the truth behind that. We do not know. And God did not seem to feel like he needed to take the time to explain it to us. From that, there are many who believe that from that civilization or whatever was created initially, that there are the disembodied spirits of whatever was destroyed when the earth was covered with water. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, for the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the... Well, where'd the waters come from? Hadn't been created yet as far as the recreation is concerned. So some say that was a flood, that God judged the fall of Satan on the earth through a flood, and now the spirits of those who dwelt here beforehand are now disembodied, and they're roaming the earth, and those are demons. There are others who would suggest that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Oh, we'll get into that in coming services where we will talk about Nephilim from Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God and the daughters of men mated and created a race of giants. And this hybrid Nephilim, giant-type creatures, when they die, their spirits have nowhere to go, so now they roam the earth. It's fascinating, isn't it? There are many other theories concerning the origin of demons, and they begin to talk about the differences between angels and demons, and angels do this, and demons do this. Can I just give you the safest position to take? And let me say this also. It doesn't matter to me what you believe. As long as you know you've got authority over them in the name of Jesus, and that when you command them to go, they got to go. That's all that matters. Everybody say, devil, go. 
So you'll see people on our program and friends will have and people can, I give them permission. You can talk about whatever you want to talk about. You can say demons are disembodied spirits from the Nephilim, you, whatever you want to talk about. As long as you say in the name of Jesus we have authority over them, that's all that matters to me. It's not an issue that we need to divide over. However, after studying this for some time, decades, there is, so the question that I ask, and I go through this in the book, there are two questions that must be asked. Number one, what biblical evidence do we have of that theory? And two, what practical application or benefit does it provide for us? And the answer to that question is, we have no biblical evidence for that. And two, there's no actually benefit or practical application from coming by knowing that devils are, but because the book of Enoch says, and this, that, and the other. Well, you need to know that so that you can have authority. No, you don't. No, you don't. Here's what you need to know to have authority over them. From Genesis Revelation is all you need to know to have authority over them. may be interesting, may be informative, but here's what you need to know. And if you know that, you can cast them out. Glory to God. So don't feel like you're inferior because you don't understand anything about the Nephilim and the demons and the, the difference between demons and angels. You know, the Bible talks about angels. There's some weird descriptions of angels in the Bible. Have you seen some of those videos on TikTok and others about how we picture angels versus what they really are? And it's like, oh, turn that off. Because it's wild. So the reality is when they bring up these distinctions, they'll say, well, we know that angels aren't demons because angels don't possess people. And then you say, well, I thought Satan possessed Judas. Yeah, but accept that. Well, no, no, you don't accept that. You have to include that. And so it could be that there's such a vast array of different kinds of angels that are beyond our comprehension that operate in so many different ways that even among the one-third that failed, there are so many different kinds. It would blow our minds, our imaginations. I can't wait to get to heaven to see all the different creatures that God has created, untainted by the curse of this world, unhindered by the sin on this planet, just beautiful in all of their creation, the four-faced beings, the four beasts that are before the throne, the angels that cry holy and the pillars in the temple shake at their shout. What a glory! time that's going to be. But you got to believe if there's so many different kinds of angels that are just full of eyes. And we see mechanisms in Ezekiel, wheels in the middle of a wheel. What is that? Some sort of cylinder turning within a cylinder. What is that? you got to believe that there's all these different kinds of angels and there's all different kinds of demons. If they are fallen angels, which I believe biblically they are, all kinds of different ones that operate differently, that look differently, that act differently, that do different things, that have different assignments from their demonic overlord. Are you guys doing all right tonight? So it's a fun subject to get into, and it's fun to dig into all the theories. And I love talking about it. I love talking with people who disagree because I think it's fascinating. And iron sharpens iron. But always make sure you get back to the Word. And you ask these two questions. What biblical evidence do you have? And two, how does that help me practically? Amen? Can we keep reading in Luke chapter 10? Just a sidebar. We will come back when we discuss the Nephilim in detail. And I can't wait to get to Skinwalker Ranch, too. We're going to talk about that. Behold, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Just that quick. Everybody say that quick. That's how long Satan's rebellion lasted. That quick. Like the flash of lightning, he decided to rebel, and that quick. And if you'll stay close to God, that's how quick he'll fall every time he tries to put his hand on you. That quick, fall like lightning. Just fall like lightning when he tries to touch you. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the reason why I'm reading this to you is because when we're dealing with these non-human entities, we're dealing with demon spirits. And we need to know what the Bible says about demon spirits. They are real. They operate in the earth. In the future, when we talk about Nephilim, we will talk about demonic technology and advances. But right now, here's what you need to know. Verse number 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy and nothing, 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 nothing shall by any means harm you. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents. This is not, by the way, for those of you who may live back up in the woods, back up in the mountains, this is not an invitation to go grab yourself a rattler and go to dancing around with it. 
I remember the first time I visited a Pentecostal church as an atheist. They started talking in tongues. I'd never seen such a thing in my life. They started laying hands on people. People started falling down. And the only thing I could think of, oh, dear Lord, are they going to pull out snakes? That's what I thought was going to happen. They're going to pull out some rattlers around here. And I was like, where, where be an exit or where would they like one? Because I'm about to make a hole in a wall to get out of here as quickly as humanly possible. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about. If they pull out the snakes, Ray Stevens sang a song. I forget how it went, but about when him and Ethel went to go visit a church back in the mountains, they were going to a Bible camp. You need to find this song by Ray Stevens. Going to a Bible camp, and they turned into the wrong church. And then they found themselves running through the woods. And the Nobody knows Ray Stevens? How many of you know Ray Stevens? The, how many of you watching online? The day the squirrel went berserk in the first self-righteous church. Well, there was a fight for revival, and that squirrel got let loose. You don't know the, the Mississippi squirrel? On your way home, Google it, Mississippi squirrel by Ray Stevens. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Alana knows it's true. On the way home, we're going to be listening to Mississippi squirrel. Not that I need it because I got the entire thing memorized. No, you do not, Pastor. When I was a kid, I'd take a trip every summer down to Mississippi to visit my granny and her aunt. Anyway, okay. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents. Is that literal or is it figurative? Now, listen, we are people who believe in the literal interpretation of the Word of God unless it's obvious that it's using figurative language. And all throughout Scripture, Satan is described as a... Just makes too much sense, doesn't it? Everybody say, I got power to tread on the devil and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you now verse number 20 get ready for this notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you hear me and know it well they are indeed subject to you Every demonic entity, every fallen angel, every evil spirit, no matter how you categorize them or what you think they may be, you may call them demons, you may call them disembodied spirits, you may call them aliens. If you are born again, they are subject to you. They, are, they have to bow their knee at the name of Jesus Christ because at that name every knee must bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So no matter what your experience has been, you need to know they are subject to you, doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. You could be five years old. Every evil spirit is subject to you if you're subject to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This is what matters. There's a chapter in my book called The Sons of God. Stand up with me just for a moment. There's a chapter in my book called The Sons of God. It's fascinating when you study it in the Old Testament. The sons of God, particularly in Job, are always a reference to fallen angels. Or the, not fallen angels, excuse me, just angelic beings. Satan was categorized in that category. These, these beings, these entities of a high level and order. And it seems like in the Old Testament, it's always referencing these angelic entities, sons of God. But if you go to the Gospel of John, the Bible says, if you obey the Spirit of God, if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are the sons of God. An immediate indication of a flipping of the order that God has replaced those fallen entities with someone who is far more powerful now because they've been made in the image of his son Jesus Christ. Because in him they live, in him they move, in him they have their being. Satan hates you because he used to have what you have. A closeness to God. And a relationship with God. And he despises that connection and he seeks to sever it. But your knowledge that your name is written in heaven 
gives you a joy that causes them to be subject to you. He's not saying that you can't be happy that demons are subject to you and excited about that. Just know where that comes from is what he's saying. Just know that the reason why they are subject to you, rejoice over the reason, not the result. Rejoice over the reason that they're subject to you. They are subject to you not because you're great and you're powerful and you're so good at praying. They are subject to you because your name is written in heaven. And that had nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. His grace, his mercy, his power. Your name is written in heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you, is your name written in heaven? With every believer praying with me right now for Judgment Day honesty, I need to ask you, is your name written in heaven? I don't know, Pastor Allen. I don't even know what that means. It means that you have accepted him as the Lord of your life. You've allowed him to come into your life to change you. If you haven't done that, you can do that. We can make sure your name is written in heaven right now when we pray this prayer. I want every hand lifted in this building. That's the international sign of surrender. Let's all surrender right now. Let's all surrender afresh and anew, watching online too. I want you to pray this prayer and let this be the beginning of your journey. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Come on, be bold, be proud, be loud. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. That no matter what's going on, no matter how dark it is, you have a plan. I want to partner with that plan. So I repent of my sin, and I turn to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I reject fear, and I declare I have faith in Jesus, and I give everything to him. I believe he is my Lord, he is my Savior, and greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Keep those hands lifted. Father, I pray now for a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit to come on everyone, a fresh authority and anoint to come on them, for you have given them power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm them. I thank you that fear has been broken over their lives, and tonight they leave this place with greater faith than they had when they came in. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even their faith. So we rejoice in the victory now. We rejoice not that the devils are subject to us, but that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you believe that, give God about 30 seconds of praise. Come on, put your hands together and bless him. Come on, right here and online. Come on. 15 more seconds to bless the name of Jesus. For he is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. Now, if you're watching online and you've been blessed by this message, go get Summoning the Demon. Go to summoningthedemon.com or you can go to blamingonthenephilim.com to get a hold of this book and just pass them out like candy. We have them available here. If you'd like to get bulk orders, you can contact our office admin at encountertoday.com you get 50% off if you order 10 or more if you order online by emailing us and we'll work that out with you how many of you thank God for our online audience one more time we'll see you guys next time we love you God bless you If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries, yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? He asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I said, well, sir, I think I know what it says. And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic. It turns out that actually, yes, these things have been shot down and crashed, and the U.S. government has the wreckage. There's just no question that some of the reports seem to tell of the sort of thing that you find in poltergeist phenomena. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. 